So assuming that I have a structure with four nodes, and the degrees of freedom are those horizontal displacements of the node, u1, u2, u3, and u4. And I have not included any of the essential boundary conditions. But I know for sure that u1 is 0. What makes u1 0 is the reaction that I wrote. And of course, that reaction is in addition to the distributed load. Because if I have a distributed load here, this will be taken as a force here and a force here. And of course here, of course here. So the distributed load is distributed along the nodes. So node two will have a distributed contribution to the element on the left and the element on the right. Node three, element on the left, element on the right. Node four, element on the left and element on the right. So this four by four system. How many unknowns do I have? Well, this is unknown, this is unknown, this is unknown, this is known, now my reaction is unknown. So I still have four unknowns. But this matrix will actually be, will not be inverted. And simply because, if you put u1 equal to u2 equal to u3 equal to u4, which means I'm rigidly moving that structure, I will not require any forces to move that structure. If u1 equal to u2 equal to u3 equal to u4 equal to 1, you should get the k multiplied by 1, 1, 1, 1 has to be equal to 0. Because the, 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 the equations allow the structure to rigidly move without any application of external forces. However, when u1 is 0, the, the, the boundary condition is that I actually have u1 equal to 0. Because u1 equal to 0, I don't, I, I'm, all, the, all this is multiplied by zero, so I don't need it. And I can forget about this equation for now. I still need it to find the reaction. I still need it to find the reaction, but I'm going to forget about it for now. And I'm going to look at my 3 by 3. And so you end up with three by three matrix, multiplied by three by one. That's equal to F2, F3, F. Matrix should be inverted. you find your u2, u3, and u4, then you put it back in the original equation, and then you can find your reaction. After you find u2, u3, u4, you put now, you know u2, u3, and u4, you know u1 is 0, you have your original matrix, you multiply it by your displacement, you get, you should get these reactions, those forces back, and you should get your reaction. Okay, so so far, we have, we have approximated our one-dimensional domain. We're saying one dimension because everything was just, we're looking for horizontal displacement to the beam. And now, and we used two types of approximation. Actually, we used one C0 approximation, but the C0 approximation that we used was once having this form 
and another C0 approximation that looked like this. A nonlinear C0 approximation. And the nonlinearity is only within the element, but at the edge of the element, I still have a C0 approximation. Now, the rest is, okay, how can I do the same thing now for a domain with two dimensions, a horizontal displacement and a vertical displacement. And it's the same thing, I'm just going to pick zones. And on this zone, so I'm going to grab this zone out. And I'm going to assume that the displacement on this element can only be such that this element deforms linearly. And this would be equivalent to the one dimension. Linear interpolation function. C0 and function of only the, no the, the displacements on the nodes. Node 1, node 2, node 3, node 4. Each node has horizontal and vertical displacement. I'm going to call this U1, V1, U2, V2, U3, V3. C0 function. How can I make it C0 function? By adding intermediate nodes and allowing the element to deform in a nonlinear fashion. It's still a C0 function because it's not differentiable on the boundaries of the element, but within the element it's not linear. So if I have something that's changing in a uh, within the element that has a parabolic variation, is the displacement has a parabolic variation within the element, then this approximation can capture it. Now the, the meshing or the, the, the type of or the shape of the of the of those zones or those elements really depends on the shape of the object that I'm trying to model. If I have a, an object that's a rectangular or if, if my object has a regular shape, then I can take my zones to be squares. And as we will see, the best elements are those elements that have a square shape. The moment the element becomes thin, imagine if you have something that's very thin, and you're trying to make it deform only linearly as a function of those uh, of the nodes on of those four displacements, you're going to get into some numerical trouble, right? some numerical issues. The best thing is to have things as square as possible. Now, if your domain, on the other hand, looks like this. For example, uh, stuff that I did for any joint, you'd like to mesh this object. You're not gonna, you might not be able to mesh it into squares, so you might have to, and, and meshing is not done by hand. You don't mesh anything, you just, there are computer algorithms that do these meshes for you. So the computer algorithms that can, that can mesh this object can only mesh it using 
uh, triangular shoes. They start at a location, put a triangle, and it's called, depending on the software that you're using, it paves its way from one edge to the other by adding triangles. It's called paving. It paves its way using triangles, and so you end up with a mesh of triangles. So the, the, and this mesh of triangles could also be linear. On the triangle, you could have a linear, or you could have a nonlinear. And this mesh of squares could be linear or could be nonlinear. Now, in the next uh, 40 minutes, or however time we have, we're going to look at the behavior of all these elements. What can each element model, and what is the limitation of and, and the names of each of these elements? Now, these elements have been studied forever. And if you've taken courses in uniform finite element analysis, you probably have seen those elements before. And any finite element analysis software has the types of elements that I'm going to talk about today. The first thing we have to do is I'm going to make to show you how the equations are formed. Assuming I have a general element, I don't know how many degrees of freedom I have, I'm just going to assume that this element has. It's in 3D and has n degrees of freedom. So the general equations look like this. If I have an object, if I have an element, the displacement within the element has three equations. It has three components. The displacement in the direction 1, the displacement in the direction 2, and the displacement in the direction 3. The displacement within the element is an approximation. I'm going to call the horizontal U, the vertical V, and the third direction W. The horizontal displacement, I'm going to use this linear approximation. And 1 U1 and 2 U2, so each node has U1. V1 and W1. Each node has three components for the displacement. The horizontal displacement within the element is equal to a function of v1 plus a function of v2 and so on. And the vertical is equal to n1v1 plus n2v2 and so on. Where u1, v1, w1, u2, v2, w2 are the, the, our, the nodes of the element, the, the degrees of freedom of the element, which are the, the displacements on the corners or the nodes of that element. And what u is the horizontal, v is the vertical, w is the third direction, 1 is node 1, 2 is node 2, and so on. I'm going to call this matrix n, and this vector ue, and from here on, my unknown is this ue. If I know this ue, I know everything about the problem. Because if I know ue, I know the displacement at any point, because simply tell me, because these are functions of x and y, or x and y and z, Tell me which point within the element, I can put x, y, z here, I'll find the displacement in this particular point. I'm going to utilize the vector representation of the string. Now the string is a matrix, but to handle the equations here, I'm going to utilize the vector representation of the string. Remember, strings is a matrix, but for me to relate the stresses to the strings, it's easier to use the vector representation. So the vector representation, I'm going to utilize those string variables. Those string variables are equal to partial u by partial x, partial v by partial x2, partial w, and so on. If I use, instead of u, I use n1, v1, n2, u2, and so on, you get this matrix that I call B, U, B. What does this matrix do? It relates the strains to the degrees of freedom of the system. If I know the degrees of freedom of the system, I can tell you the strain at every point inside the element. Just tell me which point, and I'll tell you epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, 3, and everything inside that element. The stress is equal to, I'm going to utilize the vector representation of the stress and the relationship between the stress and the strain. Now notice, C is symmetric. As 
assuming material is linear elastic. If I have a, another type of linear material, I'm going to have here more of a, I have an incremental relationship between the stress and the strain. But whatever incremental relationship I have, if it's still elastic, then this matrix has to be symmetric as well. But we're just looking at linear elastic for now. For linear elastic materials, the relationship between the stress and the strain is described by a 6 by 6 matrix. I'm going to use the virtual work approximation. Virtual work, the only, this is, this is the only possible displacement for the, for, the, uh, for my element. This is the only allowed, or the only, uh, the, the, the space of displacements that is allowed, or the, the displacement function is allowed is, is this shape, or this form, with these displacements multiplied by these degrees of freedom, and so the virtual displacement is within, it can only be within my approximation, so I'm just going to vary those u e stars, the, the, the degrees of freedom, I'm going to vary them with the star, and the virtual strain the, the, is equal to b multiplied by u e star, these are all matrices. The internal virtual work is equal to sigma j epsilon star by j, and this is done for sigma on one, epsilon on one, and so on for all of these. And external virtual work is equal to this, and you end up with, and then exactly what we did last time, the multipliers of u e star on both sides have to be equal because the multipliers of U e star on the left has to be equal to the multipliers of U e star on the right. You end up with the interface of B transpose C B D V multiplied by U e is equal to the integral of N transpose T N. This is the traction vector on the boundary. Now let's look at the, these equations and try to find the dimensions of each of those matrices. This is equal to the degrees of freedom multiplied by 1. This is equal to 3 multiplied by the degrees of freedom, or 2 multiplied by the degrees of freedom. This in 3D, and this in 2D. In the previous example, it was only 1 multiplied by the degrees of freedom. When it was 1D, we had only U, so this was 1 multiplied by the degrees of freedom. This is degrees of freedom multiplied by 1. This is how many strains? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 multiplied by degrees of freedom. If I have a, a plane strain or a plane stress, if you remember when we talked about the plane strain and the plane stress, we only looked at three of those. 1, 2, 3. So we only looked at three components of the strain. So it was 3 multiplied by the degrees of freedom. This is if it's 3D, and this is if it's 2D. For 1D, if you remember, this was only 1 multiplied by the degrees of freedom, because for 1D, we only looked at epsilon 1 more. This is a 6 by 6 when I utilize a 3D. 2D, 
I only take three components from this test and three components from this tree. So this becomes three by three. When you add all these in here, you'll get, when you put now what B is, what C is, what the degree, the dimensions of all these matrices, you'll get K, UE is equal to the force. This is degrees of freedom. Multiplied by degrees of freedom. This is degrees of freedom multiplied by one. And this is degrees of freedom multiplied by one. So let's look at the how we do this for we're gonna just repeat this for different elements. The first type of element, which is probably the one element that when FE started was the element that was utilized the most, and it's the worst element to use for any approximation, is the constant strain triangle, the linear triangle third element. As its name implies, it's constant strain. What does it mean by constant strain? I cannot apply any linear strain. So the element can only deform such that the strain is constant throughout the element. It's, it's a triangle is like, is like this. If you can imagine, it can only deform. It can only have epsilon equal constant, and we'll see how that is. For example, if I have this domain, and I'm up, so this is horizontal, and I'm applying forces here, such that the domain has a constant strain. The domain has a constant strain, I can utilize one end or two ends. Somebody is going to look at this and say, this is a terrible mesh. Why are you using this terrible mesh? It's because the whatever this, the exact solution is within the is within the approximation. However, if you if your boundaries are like this. So, in this triangle element, I assume the following. I assume three elements, or three nodes, and the displacement of each node. Each node has u1, v1, u2, v2, a horizontal displacement and a vertical displacement. And the displacement in the middle is average. say UV, average of U, of U1, U2, U3, and the V is the average of U1, V2, V3. Of course, it's a weighted average, because if I'm closer to this point, I have to utilize U2. If I'm closer to this point, I have to use the weight is according to which point I'm closer to. If I'm exactly in the middle, I 
has to be exactly the average of that displacement. Oh, oh, sorry, it has to be exactly the average of V1, V2, and V3, and the vertical displacement is the average of V1, V2, and V3. Each known, this weight, is what we call n. n1, v1, plus n2, v2, plus n3, v3. And this is n1, v1, plus n2, v2, plus n3, v3. So these are your nodes. This is the sheet function, n, which is 2 multiplied by the degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom here are 6 degrees of freedom, 3 horizontal displacements, and 3 vertical displacements. The displacements of the, the, those sheet functions turn out to be the following. N1 is equal to this, N2 is equal to this, and N3 is equal to this. Now how did I find them? I found them by one of the following two methods. The following method is by saying, okay, well, I want a function. Give me one here, and it will give me zero everywhere else. Or it will give me zero at the edges. So this function, n1, will be equal to 1 minus x1 minus x2. Where this is x1, this is x2. And the length of the edges is 1. The length of the edges is 1. So this line is 1 minus x1 minus x2. So you get this n1. n2. This is the second node. Is a function that will give me 1 here. Zero everywhere else. This function turns out to be n2 equal to this line, which is x1. And similarly, you'll find n3 is equal to x2. So those are my three <coughs> shape functions. functions have I done the following. If I, assume, if I assume for this particular shape that u so alternatively u is equal to this and v is equal to this. It's a linear function. u is, is a function of 3 degrees of freedom. v is a function of 3 degrees of freedom. It's isotropic, means I'm, I don't favor a direction over the other. Or the, it's a function of x1 or a function of x2. It's the same function. I don't favor x1 over x2. I don't favor x2 over x1. Three bounding conditions for you. Replace a1, a2, a3 with u1, u2, and u3. Also three bounding conditions for v. Replace v1, v2, v3 with v1, v2, and v3. You'll get the u is equal to u1, n1, plus u2, n2, plus u3, n3 and v is equal to v1 and 1, v2 and 2, plus v3 and 3. The same equations that we have. Now in your book, you'll always find me asking the following question. The sum of n1 plus n2 plus n3 is always equal to 1. And I always ask me, every element, why? 
It's not why is it one, why is it important? What can an element model in which the shape of the sum of those shape functions is always equal to one at any point? So this is a two-dimensional problem. I, I'm only looking at, in the horizontal or vertical displacement. So I only look at those three strains. So this is my B matrix multiplied by U B. Now look at the simplicity of the, the matrix. The matrix B, I really, it's it's just made out of constants. Negative one, one negative one, negative one negative one one one, which tells you B is not a function of x and y. Now look at it. the n. To calculate those forces, 
I write this equation, which I obtained from the from the equation of virtual work. Using the equation of virtual work, this is the equation that gives me the forces on the nodes. M transpose multiplied by rho b, where this is m transpose. Rho b is the two components of the displacement of the rho b, rho b1 and rho b2. And you integrate this over the volume, and you get, when you integrate this, you get this, that. You simply take that total force and divide it by uh, 3 and put 1 on each node. Now this is simple for a linear element. For a non-linear element, it's not going to be that simple. For a linear element, you take the total force and divide it into three components, one on each node, one for the vertical, one for the horizontal, and you get those um, and you get those uh, forces. And it, there's a the, the reason why it's six and it's not three is because the area is equal to L over two. The area is equal to a is equal to one by one by two, so it's equal to one over two units. That's why here you have rho b one over six, not over three. And similarly, if I have a distributed load on the edge, this distributed load, I need to take that distributed load and put equivalent forces on the nodes because I don't need to deal with distributed loads anymore, I deal with only forces on the nodes. Those forces on the nodes are obtained using this equation and transpose the end, integrated only over the surface of the end. And similarly, you put T1 and T2, those as two components, a horizontal component and a vertical component. And when you multiply these by each other, you get those forces that are acting, the equivalent forces on your head. These are the normal forces due to distributed load, distributed body forces and distributed load on the element. And when you assemble the global stiffness matrix, these are the numbers that you take and put in your global stiffness matrix and global nodal forces vectors. So the limitation of this element, the huge limitation is constant strain. is to 
levitations to show you the levitation of linear elastic analysis under our rotations. So you need to, so there are lots of, there are a few tutorials, go through the tutorials to see how to use X. What you're required to do is, there is a, a I think it's a, there is a certain dimension, maybe two by four, the dimension does not really matter. What you're asked to do is take the finite element analysis and apply the following boundary conditions. Apply boundary conditions such that u equals zero, v equals zero. Put let's say theta equal 30 degrees, you've got u1 equal, v1 equal, v1 v1, u2 v2. You have the, the, the coordinates, the new coordinates of this point, the new coordinates of this point. Apply these as boundary conditions for the, the, the displacement. And you have the displacement of this point. So apply the displacement of this point as boundary conditions for a certain angle, let's say theta equal 30 degrees, using linear elastic analysis, full integration elements. And what do you expect? And then plot the strings. Now, if, this, if, if, if there were no errors, what do you expect the strings to be? Yeah, what's that? I expect the strings to be zero. If there are no errors, I expect the strings to be zero. If you, if you get zero strings, you've used the wrong element. You've used the mod, you used, just use the full integration element, okay? The element that we're discussing here. You should get, plot the strings and you'll find, and use only one element. When you plot the strings, you will get non zero strings. Not only this, you will get non-zero reactions, even though you haven't put any load on the structure. You haven't put any load on the structure. All you have to do is you took that structure and rotated it. So you haven't added forces, you haven't strained or you haven't displaced anything, but you'll get non-zero reactions and you'll get non-zero strains. But I now want you to do this and change the angle. Put angle 1 degree, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees. And the strains that you will get in chapter 3 and compare with the expected erroneous, I'm going to call them erroneous strains in chapter 3 for the small strain matrix. I don't remember the exact, um, but you, I think it, it will look like this. Epsilon will be equal to cosine theta minus 1. The strain matrix looks like this, I, I believe cosine theta minus 1. When theta is very small, cosine theta is almost 1, which makes it 0. But for a larger rotations, your cosine theta is not 1, and so you get epsilon 1, epsilon 2, 2. So, and that's due to the choice of the strain matrix. And what do you get out of this problem? Whenever you're analyzing a beam or anything, once you see an element that's rotating in space, you know that the strains in this element is not are not correct. Then you actually you actually make the structure stiff. By utilizing the strain matrix, you're making the structure stiff. And you're making you, you don't you cannot model buckling of this. Because if you try to buckle anything, as you buckle, the elements start rotating. But for the elements to rotate, 
they need additional forces to repeat. And that's why linear elastic structures, when you use a linear elastic finite diameter analysis, you cannot model buckling because you're not able to bend the structure. If you put a structure linear elastic, and you keep pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, you're gonna squish it before you buckle it. Once you start using a nonlinear analysis, because the rotations are not accompanied by any forces, then a slight, any numerical instability will just cause, the numerical stability will model the actual physical instabilities and you'll be able to get buckling of the structure. So this is the purpose of this example, or this problem. So you have to solve this a few times for different angles to get to and compare this with your solution. And the third problem you're asked to put a load here. Change the number of elements on the height of the end, uh, on the height of your V. And as you change the number of elements, you will you will find that you're getting a better approximation. You increase the the number of elements, you, you get a, a slightly different answer. And then I want you to plot this answer as you increase the number of elements. All right. So. Look at your assignment, and if you have any questions, email me, and uh, I will, again, as I mentioned, I will email you on Thursday, the midterm, and expect a solution by uh, Monday, and I might include maybe a question using Mathematica, and a question using Abacus, and also something that you might have to look on the internet for. If you use any resources, just write what resources you use. Just the, the, the purpose of the exam is to actually to give you problems that you guys think about and try to find a, a solution. It's not it's not to get a final answer. It's not to get the full answer. It's just to see what you find, what if you understand the question or not. It's not about oh here's the right answer. I found it in a book. And you can compare this answer to the answer in the book. No, it's, I need you I need you to write your own opinion or whatever. If you find any material, you have to write it in your own words. You understand it. It's not it's not the it's not just a copy of what you read. Alright? Any questions? Okay. Perfect. So we'll see you in two weeks.